In our consecutive expositions of the book of Romans, we are now in chapter 3. And we shall read verses 1 to 20. Romans 3, beginning from verse 1. Then what advantage has a Jew has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also being judged as a sinner? Why not say, as we are slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We'll just join our hearts and pray. For the Lord's blessing as we consider his words. Let's pray. Our Father, we know that the devil is out to distract us from the ministry of your holy word. We remember the parable of the Lord Jesus. And how the word is often sown. And the devil seeks to snatch away that word. And therefore we plead with you that you would help us, that we will not be distracted from focusing upon the ministry of your Holy Word. We pray for the blessing of your Holy Spirit to aid us, to help us, gird up the loins of our minds, ponder your words, for you have promised that you will give us understanding. We pray for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. May we not only understand your word, but may we feel the force of the truth in our hearts. May that word come to us like a hammer that breaks, like a fire that burns. May you remove any remaining darkness from our souls and give us the light of your word. Hear us. Bless your word for the sanctification of your people and even for the salvation of the lost. For these things we plead in Jesus' name. Amen.
you do not need to convince a human being that he need, he is in need of food, water, and air. Everybody is aware of that need. You don't have to try to convince him of that need. You don't have to try to help him and show him he needs those things. You don't have to try to persuade him. You don't have to argue with him. Everybody knows they are in need of them. But when it comes to the need of the gospel, it is entirely different. Sin and pride have so blinded us of our real condition as fallen human beings that we do not readily see our need of the gospel. Therefore, before expounding the content of the gospel in the book of Romans, Paul, under the infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit, first shows why people are in need of the gospel. That gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And that need arises from the frightening reality that all human beings are under the wrath of God Almighty. All suppress the truth in unrighteousness and therefore all are under the wrath of God. And this reality is true of Gentiles as well as Jews. The Gentiles who, during the time of Paul, did not enjoy God's special revelation are under the wrath of God, as we have seen in chapter 1. And even the latter part of chapter, or the opening parts of chapter 2. And the Jews who enjoy God's special revelation are also under the wrath of God. Now in this section, read in your hearing, beginning from chapter 3 verse 1 and following, Paul gives his final arguments why all, including Jews, are in need. Of the gospel. And he does three things here in order to do that. First, he answers pertinent questions. Verses 1 of chapter 3 to verse 9. And then he gives scriptural confirmations. And then thirdly, he makes his final argument. The final argumentation. So let us consider each of this one at a time. First, let us consider the pertinent questions. There are four pertinent questions that are really anticipated objections that Paul answers here. And then he makes one concluding question. Note the first question, which is really an anticipated objection in verse 1. Then, what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? In chapter 2, which we considered as Lord's Day, Paul has made it clear that just being a physical descendant of Abraham, having the old covenant sign of physical circumcision, and just being part of the Jewish nation under the old covenant cannot deliver anyone from the wrath of God and from the judgment of God. Now, if that is the case, an objection is often raised. 
What then? What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? If being part of the old covenant nation, if being just a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if having the sign of the old covenant community circumcision cannot deliver from the wrath of God and shields anyone from the judgment of God. So what advantage then has the Jew or what is the benefit of circumcision? Note Paul's response in verse 2. Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jews had plenty of advantages or privileges which the Gentiles never enjoyed. Paul will speak of them even later in Romans chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. And first in the list of those privileges and the chief of them is that they were entrusted with the oracles of God or God's revelatory words. It was in conjunction with the formation of the nation of Israel in Mount Sinai that God handed over to them living oracles through Moses. Acts 17.38 And the old covenant scripture was entrusted by God to the Jewish nation. And what a great privilege that was which the Gentile nations did not enjoy. For in Psalm 119 verse 05, the psalmist says, Your word, God's word, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Without the light of God's revelatory words, his oracles, we are in darkness. We cannot properly interpret reality. We cannot accurately interpret reality. The facts that we know from God's creation are not enough to make sense of reality because there are so many things that we do not know that would then make our interpretation of what we know so limited and so distorted. The psalmist says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Or, in the language of Psalm 19, verse 7 and following, the psalmist says, using different descriptions of God's living oracles, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure or clear, enlightening the eyes. And he adds, they are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of a honeycomb. That's how valuable the word of God is. It's more valuable than all the gold bars in Fort Knox. And it is more delicious and all the chocolates in the world. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of a honeycomb. So what a big privilege that was to be entrusted with the oracles of God. God's revelatory word. God gave to the Jews his word to be accepted by faith Obeyed, held in honor, and passed on to others long before the church was formed 
At the first coming of Christ, the Jews were already entrusted with the oracles of God, the Old Testament scriptures. So there can be no doubt. It was a great advantage to be part of the old covenant nation. Then note the second question, which is really an anticipated objection in verse 3. What then? If some did not believe, some of the Jews, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. Will it? Now the question grows out of the first objection. At the heart of this objection is the reality that God made many promises to the Jewish people in his revelatory word. And yet some of them never enjoy the promises because of their unbelief. They never enjoy it. But can the tragic reality nullify the faithfulness of God? If God made many precious promises to the Jews, preserved them in the Old Testament scriptures, and yet some of the Jews, in fact many of them, never enjoyed that which God promised, will this because of their unbelief, will this not nullify the faithfulness of God? Now, Paul will answer this objection more fully in the latter part of the book of Romans. But for now, Paul just blasts the objection with the assertion that the objection is completely absurd. He doesn't even give us arguments from the scriptures. He simply shows that to raise that objection would be absurd. Verse 4, may it never be, or it could be translated, perish the thought. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. In other words, Paul says, and he will come back to this objection, he will give a biblical answer from the Old Testament concerning this objection. But for now, Paul simply blasts it by saying that that is completely absurd. God is always right and true. Or else, he would not be God at all. To impute any unfaithfulness in God because of the way as God has dealt with the old covenant people of God to say that he must then be, is their unfaithfulness even to raise the objection is absurd. God is always right and true or else he would not be God at all. So even if all men are found liars, God cannot act contrary to his very nature and being. God will always be true and faithful. That is one reality that will never change. He says, so don't raise that objection. Don't impute any unfaithfulness in God because by imputing any unfaithfulness of God, then you deny God for being God. Even if all men are liars, even if all men are unfaithful, God will always be faithful he, because he cannot act against himself. To raise that objection is absurd. Now 
And although he will provide a more thorough answer to that objection, now he says, don't even entertain that. To impute any unfaithfulness of God is to deny the Godhood of God. Let God be true, even if all men are liars. It's an absurd objection because you are putting into question God for who God is. It's as if it's absurd. You cannot move into that path. You cannot put into question God's faithfulness at all. Because then God would no longer be God at all. And that's how you deal with problems when you don't understand God's ways. You do not question God's character because you cannot understand some of his ways. And you say, if God promised and he did not fulfill, then is there any faithfulness in God for you to raise that objection? It's absurd. If there's anything you must never forget, is that God will always be God, because he cannot go against himself. He can never be unfaithful. And that's the way we should deal with objections like that. And this is substantiated in Scripture, even in David's penitential psalm, Psalm 51. As it is written, verse 4, that you, God, says David, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judge. David's sin and failure in his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and murder by proxy did not nullify the faithfulness of God. In fact, it only underscored it. As David puts it, so that you, God, may be justified in your words and prevail or triumph even when you are judged. So Paul says, don't ever, don't ever even entertain that. To put into question the faithfulness of God because there are certain things you cannot understand of his ways. is completely unacceptable. It is Absurd. And then note the third question or objection in verse 5. And this is how twisted man can be in his efforts to suppress the truth, to deny the judgment of God. This is how absurd man will go just to suppress the truth. Notice in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. What shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. Now Paul here, this again objection grows out of the second objection. And it is a sort of objection that only humans will ever come up with. I am speaking in human terms. And the essence of this objection is that if our sins and failures, if the sins and failures of the Jewish nation will only underscore and even more clearly show the righteousness of God, would it be righteous for God to punish them in wrath for their sins and failures? Only human beings that are fallen could ever come up with such a twisted logic. Did not their unrighteousness serve to display the glory of God's righteousness? Should not God then be pleased instead of their sins and unbelief and failures 
since it only highlights even more clearly his God's righteousness. And notice Paul's reply in verse 6. He says, may it never be. Or, I prefer the translation, and this expression can be translated in different ways. God forbid, may it never be. But I would prefer, perish the thought. Don't even entertain such a foolish, absurd, absurd notion. May it never be. Verse 6, for otherwise, how will God judge the world? Now here, Paul is arguing on the basis that the objection is absurd. It's completely absurd because it would rule out completely the reality that God will judge the world. There will be a day of judgment. If it is unrighteous for God to judge people's unrighteousness, even the Jews, because their unrighteousness would even display more clearly God's righteousness, then that would mean that God cannot act as a judge at all. Because in a real sense, every everyone's unrighteousness would only further display the righteousness of God. So if the unrighteousness of men serves to magnify the righteousness of God, and therefore, the idea is, why will God be angry with the unrighteousness of men when it will only display His righteousness? Should God inflict wrath? Paul says, of course God still will. Otherwise, God cannot act as judge at all. There will be no judgment to come. And even the worst sinner cannot and should not be judged by God. And Paul says, that's absurd. Therefore, the thought, the idea, the objection must not even be entertained. God will punish in wrath the unrighteousness of men, even if that unrighteousness does serve to display more clearly the righteousness of God, because to deny the judgment of God is completely absurd. There will be a day of judgment. And deep within, we know that God must punish the unrighteousness of men. If we even think that the unrighteous should be punished, the criminal, the pedophile, how much more God? And then note the fourth question, which is really an anticipated objection. In verse 7 to 8. But if through my lie, the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that God, that good, may come. Now here, Paul repeats the third objection, but gives it a more specific and a more personal spin. There can be no doubt that sin can and does serve to glorify God. That reality is something that Paul will speak about later in chapter 9. That the rejection of the Jews of Christ only further displays the glory of God 
and achieves the purpose of God that the gospel should be preached to all the Gentiles. In fact, the worst crime ever committed by human beings in crucifying the Lord of glory only served to glorify God the most. The Jewish rejection of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, only served to glorify God the most because through it, God accomplished the greatest good for humanity, the salvation of sinners through the death of his son. So will God then judge the Jews for crucifying Christ? Will God judge Judas who betrayed Christ? Should he not rather reward Judas for betraying? Because in the death of Christ, that served to glorify God. Because through the death of Christ, he accomplishes greatest work. The salvation of sin. No question about the fact that sin and human unbelief does serve to glorify God. However, Paul ne never thought that reality should serve as a rule of human conduct. Paul never said or taught or proclaimed, so then let us do evil. That good may come. Now Paul was being slandered. That that is what he was saying. If the evil deeds of men. Can serve. Good. In glorifying God. So let us do evil. So that good may come. Well there were people who were saying. That is what Paul is teaching. But Paul say no, that is an evil report. That is a slanderous report. That is a false report. We never said, let us do evil that good may come. But they were Jews who would reason that way. Then the Jews should be rewarded by God. Because if they did not crucify Christ or had Jesus crucified, then he would not accomplish salvation for men. And there will be no salvation. God should be pleased with the Jews for rejecting Messiah. For crucifying Messiah. Now Paul has already answered his objection. If that were the case. Then there will be no judgment at all. Because every and faithfulness and unrighteousness of men will serve ultimately the glory of God. If that were true, then God will not be able to judge anyone at all, which is totally absurd. And since Paul already answered this objection earlier, his answer to this objection is very brief. Verse 8. Their condemnation is just. Paul just adds that those who reason that way only show that their condemnation is just. It is one of the worst kinds of truth suppression that those who argue that way only shows that they rightly deserve God's judgment. Let us do good. That let us do evil that good may come. If they reason that way, that only show how desperate they are in their truth suppression, and therefore their condemnation is just. In the words of Lenski, and I quote, when our sin makes God's faithfulness, righteousness, and truth stand out, 
This is due not to a service we render to God, but a service which God forces our sin to render. His great attributes need nothing from us. Least of all our sin to make them stand out in contrast. Rightly he damns the sinner, especially the one to whom he has given the tremendous advantage of his word. And who abuses that advantage. Their condemnation is just. Now here Paul is seeking out the holes. The Jews will try to hide. In order to say no God can judge us. God can be angry with us. Even our failure serve to do good. To glorify God. That's how twisted humans can become in their truth suppression. Now after all, the pertinent objections have been clear. Paul now, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, drives home the conclusion by raising a question. Verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? And the we, Paul is referring to the Jews collectively. The unbelieving Jews. And by they, Paul is referring to Gentiles collectively. The unbelieving Gentiles. Are the Jews better than the Gentiles? And Paul's answer is clear. Verse 9. Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. All the objections raised earlier in the chapter are only the last ditch efforts. The last remaining Dark caves the Jews will hide into in order to escape the inescapable conclusion. But the Jews have no excuse whatsoever. The Gentiles are all under sin. Paul has already shown that earlier. And the Jews are not in any better position as the Gentiles. All are under sin. And all are in desperate need of the gospel. And my friend, listen. Many will try to wiggle out from that reality. Many will not want to accept that I deserve hell. I may not be perfect, but I am not that as bad. I'm rendering service to God even for the evil that I do. So that from the evil that I do, good may come out. Man will try to wiggle out of the reality that all are under sin and therefore all are under the wrath of God. Man will use even the most absurd reasoning to deny that reality. That all are under sin. All are under the wrath of God. And all are in desperate need of the gospel. And you know what? Teaching systematic theology to high school students. I have heard how twisted. Their questions can be to try to escape the force and the claim of truth. Now after answering pertinent questions, consider with me in the second place in the passage as Paul draws his final concluding argument. Scriptural confirmations that all men are under sin, all are under the wrath of God, and all are in desperate need of the gospel. The scriptural confirmations. 
And we find the scriptural confirmations in verses 10 to 18. All are under sin, verse 9. Jews and Greeks, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understand, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of apps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Here, we have a chain of citations from the Old Testament scriptures to confirm what Paul has been arguing for. That all are under sin, all are under the wrath of God, all are in need of the gospel. This chain of citations fall into two parts. First, the human rejection of God with the transition of evil human actions against one another. Verses 10 to 12. And then secondly, the evil of human actions against one another with the transition of human rejection of God. Verses 13 to 18. Now look at the first part, verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. This scriptural citation is either from Psalm 14 or from Psalm 53, which are very similar. And it describes the universal problem of the old humanity fallen in Adam. There is none who is righteous. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. All have become useless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Paul said. This is the condition of man falling in sin. This is the old humanity. Unredeemed by Christ. Now let us look at the psalm where this citation comes from. Psalm 14. And this is one of the best psalms that describes the universal problem of man. Psalm 14 verses 1 to 3. Now Paul does not cite the entire section but simply portions of it. But notice verse 1. The Psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart. Not in his lips. In his heart. There is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Note that this denial of the existence of God is not really done in one's lips. It is a heart denial of the existence of the one and only true God. And this problem is a universal problem. The problem infects the entire human race. Verse 2, the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. This is a universal problem. A problem that infects the entire human race. 
Even false religions are man's effort to deny the existence of the one and only true God by exchanging the truth of God for a lie in the form of Christ idolatry. That's Romans 1. They know God through God's works of creation, but they deny the existence of the one true and the living God. Not with their lips, because they have religion, false religion, but with their hearts. And they deny the existence of the one true and only God by exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Exchanging the worship of God with the worship of that which is merely created by men or any of God's creation. Even the Jews who profess the existence of the one true and living God really deny him with their lips. I'm sorry, with their hearts. Even the Jews who profess the existence of the one true and living God with their lips are in reality trying to deny the existence of the one true and living God. God looks down from heaven, looks at the sons of men. If there's anyone really seeking after God, really wants to know God, really wants to have communion with God, and God says, no, there is not even one who seeks after God. The language of their heart, not with their lips, there is no God. People try to convince themselves that the one true and living God that really exists does not really exist. And they do that by all sorts of ways, by exchanging the truth of God for a lie in Christ idolatry, or even the Jews who profess the name of the true and the living God with their lips, but in their hearts they deny. And therefore when God came in his son, the Lord Jesus, they crucified him. They rejected the Lord of glory. No one seeks for God. No one really understands. All are trying to deny the existence of the one true and the living God in their hearts. And what is the result of this heart denial? Moral corruption. Verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if they, there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Idolatry is not man's best effort and sincere effort to try to know God and to worship a God that is so far and hidden they cannot know Him. No! It is man's effort to bury within his heart the knowledge of the true God by exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And all these false religions are man's attempt to deny the existence of the true God by worshipping gods that are no real gods. A very similar psalm, which is also the possible source of Paul's scriptural citation in Romans, is Psalm 53, very similar to Psalm 14. And in her, it's hard to tell which really of the psalm Paul is citing. Because the language is very similar. A muscle of David. Verse 1. 
The fool, verse 1, has said in his heart, there is no God. Again, in his heart. This is not lip profession. This is heart denial. It is from within. They are corrupt, have committed abominable deed. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men. Jew and Gentile, to see if there's anyone who understands, who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even. In other words, the problem is a universal problem. Verse 4, have the workers of wickedness no knowledge, who eat up my people as though they are bread and have not called upon God? The problem is a universal human problem. It infects the entire human race, fallen in Adam and unredeemed by Christ. That's the condition of every single human being, Jew or Gentile. The second part of the scriptural citation is structured in the reverse of the first part. It shows that the evil deeds of men with the transition of man's rejection of God. Back to Romans 3. It's amazing how Paul structures this. The root, the fruit, the fruit, the root of the problem. Verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. That's the fruit. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path, and the path of peace they have not known. And here's the root. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This chain of scriptural citation comes from different parts of the book of Psalms and from the book of Isaiah. Just pieced together. The four descriptions deal with human speech. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving the poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The human rejection of the one and only true God finds its first expression in human speech. It finds its expression in death, dealing, deceit, poison, cursing, bitterness. That's the fruit. The next three descriptions deal with human ways that are destructive. Look at it. Verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. The path of peace they have not known. And then the final description caps the human problem by returning to the root of the problem, to the theme of human rejection of God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is, no reverence, no real respect for God. So what Paul has been arguing since the latter part of Romans 1 is not something new. That all are under sin, Jews and Gentiles alike, because all suppress the truth they know about God in unrighteousness. Either through the works of creation or through special revelation, even the voice of conscience. Man will twist and make moralistic judgments on others, but refuse to see that they're very condemning of others, condemn themselves. The Old Testament scriptures bear witness to the universal human problem. Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. 
and all are in need of the gospel. But then having considered the pertinent questions and the scriptural confirmations, let us consider thirdly from the passage the final argumentation, the final concluding disputation, if you will. We find that in verses 19 to 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the Lord, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now in verse 19, we have a statement of the purpose of the law. A purpose of the law. And by law, what is Paul referring to? Well, if you read the commentators, many commentators say that by the law, Paul is referring to the Old Testament scripture as a whole. Because the word, the law, is sometimes used in the scriptures as a technical term for the whole of the Old Testament scripture. Moreover, they would argue that the preceding chain of scriptural citations points us to the same conclusion. That the law refers to the Old Testament scriptures. There is a problem, however, to that interpretation. If you substitute the word, the law, Uh, if you substitute to the word the law, the word the scriptures, in verses 19 to 20 and down to verse 21, the thought would not make any sense at all. Let's do that. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the scripture says, it speaks to those who are under the scripture. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the scripture, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the scripture comes the knowledge of sin. And then if you connect that to verse 21. But now, apart from the scripture, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the scriptures. The law and the prophets. Does it make sense? Right? So if you substitute the word scripture to the word the law, it doesn't make sense. Especially when you come to verse 21. But apart from the scripture, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the scriptures, the law and the prophets. Hmm? Doesn't make sense. Therefore, the law here must refer not to the scripture as a whole, but God's moral law or requirement summarized particularly in the Ten Commandments. His moral law. His universal law. It refers to the universal obligation of man to God and to his fellow men. And this is how Paul also uses the word the law Later in the book of Romans. It's a technical term he used. Romans 7 verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary. I would not have come to know sin. Except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting. If the law had not said. You shall not covet. Paul is using the word the law as a technical term for the moral law of God written in tablets of stones under the old covenant. And by the phrase those who are under the law who is Paul referring to? We have to deal with this first before we piece the argument together. Okay, Who is he referring to? Those who are under the law. Paul is referring particularly to the Jews whom God gave the law by special revelation. 
We have seen that in Romans 2. However, we must not think that the Gentiles are excluded. Because earlier in Romans 2, which we have studied, Paul has argued that although the Gentiles are without the law, that is, God's law given by special revelation, he says that they are a law to themselves in that they do what the law does. Romans 2, 14 to 15. In fact, in Romans 1, Paul said that even the wicked pagan Gentiles know the ordinances or judgment of God. Romans 1.32 They have a sense of that, what that law is. Although it was to the Jews that God gave it by special revelation. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall have no other gods before me. Those are universal obligations which, although the Gentiles did not have by special revelation, they had a sense of it. And that was something that God gave in Mount Sinai by special revelation to the Jews. So according to Paul, what is one of the purposes of the law? What's the testimony of the law? What is the purpose of its testimony? Look at verse 19 of Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable. The purpose of the law is to shut up man's self-righteous mouths. It is meant to silence all human boasting. It was meant to show that all human beings are accountable, that is, guilty before God. The law given by special revelation to the Jews. And that same law which the Gentiles even have a sense with. For they are a law to themselves. For they do what the law does. Its purpose is to shut up man's self-righteous mouths. To silence all human forces. To better the words of another. When human achievement is measured against what God requires. The law. There is no place for pride or boasting. But only for silence. That lends consent to the verdict of guilty. Of course the moralist. Does not do that. He looks at the faults of others but does not apply the law to himself. Knowing that the law on the basis of which he judges others, he is also condemning himself. But the law's testimony has the purpose of silencing all the mouths of human beings. And to agree with the verdict in the light of the law guilty and what is the rationale of that why does the law serve the purpose of silencing our self-righteous mouths verse 20 because by the works of the law no flesh no human being will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. As a principle of equity, only the doers of the law will be justified in God's sight. Romans 2.13 
But for all fallen human beings, no works of the law can ever be the basis of being declared righteous in God's sight. It is existentially not possible. And why is it not existentially possible? For the true knowledge of God's law only increases our consciousness of our own sinfulness you shall not you shall not you shall not take the name of the Lord your God you shall have no other gods etc true knowledge of the law only increases our consciousness of our own failures the law only exposes how sinful we really are it's intended to shut our self-righteous mouth. As the old Puritans would say, the law acts only like a mirror to expose the dirt of our faces. But it cannot act as a soap and water to wash the dirt away. That's what the law does. Now, because of sin and pride, we will always try to deny that we are all under sins and that we are all under the wrath of God. That is why Paul spends so much time and effort trying to prove that even before he will expound. The content of the gospel. He knows. That human sin and pride. Will always try to deny the reality. That we are all under sin. We are all under the wrath of God. And God is justly. Angry with us. That is why he spends so much time trying to prove that. We do not have to be convinced of our need of water, of food, of air. But we need to be convinced of our need of the gospel. Because sin and pride blinds us of our need of it. But listen, listen, listen. Unless you stop denying your sinfulness and God's righteous wrath against you, you will never qualify for God's free grace in the gospel. You won't qualify. That's a strange qualification. But unless you see your own sinfulness and God's righteous anger against you, you will never qualify for the free grace of God in the gospel. And you will die in your sins to face the righteous judgment of God. So let go of your foolish pride. Your self-righteousness. Even an atheist. He knows that God exists. But he is so angry with God. He doesn't like this God. He will try to deny this God. But you often will catch him in his speech. Like one atheist who said, Thank God I'm an atheist. You'll always catch him. You know that God exists. Let go of that foolish pride. Stop all specious arguments to deny your sinfulness. 
to deny God and God's righteous anger against you. Wound it with humility. And only then will you qualify for God's free grace in the gospel. See, I grew up in the church. I'm not like those pagan Gentiles on the streets. I know the Bible. I grew up in a, in a church setting. I attend worship service where there are no idols, but the Bible is read and expounded. I know a lot. I'm better than others. How can God be justly angry with me and send my soul to hell? My friend, you're no better than the Jews. All are under sin. All are under God's righteous anger. And if you own that with humility, only then will you qualify for God's free grace in the gospel. As one Puritan preacher will say, when you go to God, empty your pockets. Don't hide anything. Confess your need. For only then will you qualify for God's free grace in the gospel. And believers, listen. I've said it before, but I will say it again. Because this is where many in evangelism are off the track. Your first task in evangelism, in proclaiming the gospel, is to show people's need for that gospel so that they will qualify for it. That's your first task. Therefore, learn the skill of exposing human sinfulness, human rebellion. Learn the skill to demolish specious human arguments, to deny the reality of God, to deny and minimize human sinfulness, and to deny the reality of God's righteous anger against sinful humanity. You have to learn the skill to expose the human need the real need for only when a person is convinced of that will that person qualify for the free grace offered in the gospel only then will the gospel make sense to that person. Only then will the person really value the good news. When he understands the bad news, only will he rejoice in the sound of God's gospel. But this is risky business. Telling a person, exposing his sinfulness, his idolatry. Don't say, well, you know, you're just, you, you, you just don't know better. That's why you're worshiping these idols. No. Tell him he knows better that he should not worship and he should repent. Because he knows better. But he's suppressing the truth. In his heart, he denied the existence of the only true God that he knows. By burying it with lies. Learn the skill. Be a master of this. Because the more you know how to do it, the better a proclaimer of the gospel you will be. But you have to confront people. That's not just ignorance. It is culpable ignorance. 
you're guilty. And then, show them their need. Tell them the gospel. That this God who is angry with sinners because of their truth suppression in love invites them to partake of salvation. That salvation he provided in his son, the Lord Jesus. That is what parents should try to persuade their children. Don't say, you're so good kids. who will never feel the need of the gospel. Expose their heart. Expose it. Don't bend the rules to make it easier for them. Tell them the reason why you find it so hard. Because your heart is a rebel. You're under God's wrath. But there is hope for you. God in love has provided a way for you to be right with him through his son. I don't know why modern evangelism have gone so off the track when it comes to this. Don't offend people by telling them their sinfulness, their wrong, their truth suppression. Just befriend them to the gospel. No, you can't, my friend. Tell them sweet words. No. Or they never see their need of that gospel. You have to convince them. You are sinful. You are a truth suppressor. You're under sin. You're under God's wrath. God is rightly angry at you. But God in love offers you salvation in his son. That's the way the apostles preach. You look at all the book of Acts. That is how the Lord Jesus preached. Even to the Pharisees. Although how much they were angry at him. He had to show them their need first. Or else they will never see the value of the gospel. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this exposition of the gospel in the book of Romans. The standard of which we are to measure all efforts to preach the gospel. We pray then for us believers that we will learn from the apostolic way, from the biblical way of proclaiming the gospel. And for those, O oh Lord, here who are still denying the reality that they are deserving of nothing but hell. Lord, we pray that you would search them out and expose their dark caves where they try to hide from and show them the rebelliousness of their hearts, their truth suppression, their specious arguments to try to deny reality. And we pray that they would humbly own to the fact that you are rightly angry with them so that they will see their need for the gospel. Lord, hear us. Bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen.